All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the third video of, of our Calico technology class. Um, so we started out by talking about functions and limits uh, or functions and intervals, basically how um, intervals in terms of um, kind of putting our numbers onto a line and then putting those numbers through a machine when we're talking about functions. Um, and then we kind of studied a bit of interesting behavior about these sort of the functions, the machines or these curves that they produce um, by with limits to understand that even if the value doesn't exist at a point, um, we can still assert that there's a certain behavior happening at that point. And today we're going to be using that definition of a limit to be able to find something that we're going to call that we that's called the derivative. Okay, so before we talk about the derivative, though, we need to spend a little bit of time reviewing always over something called slope. Okay, slope. We've already mentioned that this a, a few times, right? When we've talked about um, lines, graphing lines, we're going to have y2 minus y, you know, uh, you're going to have your, the slope of the line, right? Tells you kind of how much it's inclined, right? And the way that we find the slope, right, is it's rise over run, right? So if we have two points, what we do is we take two points of x2 and y2 <coughs> and an x1 and y1, and we subtract the y's from each other and subtract the x's from each other. And that's going to tell us what the slope of our line is going to be. Right, so in a situation, right, for example, that let's say here I have a point um, negative three, negative two, and the point um, one, two. Okay, and I want to find the slope between these two points. Well, I'm going to call this point x1, y1, and I would call this point x2, y2. <coughs> and so what we're going to do, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, um, <coughs> to find the slope between these two points is I'm going to exactly plug them into here, right? So y2, I said was 2. y1, we said was minus 2. So that gives us 2 plus 2, essentially, over x2, which x2 is 1, minus x1, which x1 we said was negative 3. So we get 1 minus negative 3, or plus 3. So that gives us 4 over 4, which is 1. So our line has a slope of 1. So that kind of worked out pretty nicely um, in that case, right? And so we would get a line through these two points, which has a slope of one and a particular y-intercept, uh, which in this case, I believe would also be one. I won't draw the line all the way, but there's kind of the, uh, what we're looking at, okay? Now, here's an interesting question. What's the slope of a curve, okay? Uh, what's the slope of... <coughs> what's the slope of this parabola? What's the slope of this parabola? Give us a second to kind of think about that question. Because it doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? Um, the parabola doesn't really have slope. Um, I mean, it doesn't have a consistent, right? It, it, um, I mean, sure, we could take a couple of points on it, right? So I could take, um, maybe I'll kind of follow along with what the book has. Um, we'll call this point P. And actually, let me, uh, just, just to help us visualize this, I'm going to like make this graph a bit more drastic. Let's do this. Okay. <coughs> So let's call, let's say we have a point P and a point Q. Okay. And I want to see what's, you know, I, I can find the slope between those two points, right? Because again, we can just use this formula. 
And so we're going to say, you know, we'll get kind of a line that looks like that. But that's not really telling me the slope of the actual, like, slope of the parabola at any point, as much as it's just telling me, well, the, the slope of, you know, between a couple points on the parabola. Okay, so what we might be interested in is like, maybe I just want to know the, the slope at point Q, right? So maybe let's, um, you know, instead of putting Q here, let's, let's bring it a little closer. So here's, I'll call this Q1 and we'll call this Q2, okay? So that'll give us a line that's a bit, you know, maybe a bit closer to what we're looking for, but still really doesn't exactly represent it. Uh, we'll put Q3 here, okay? That's very much in the direction we want to go. Um, <laughs> might be kind of accurate, but still really is not doing a whole lot for us. It does not really speak a whole lot of good information. Um, in this case, it, 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 uh, it doesn't really tell us exactly what's going on there, right? Now, some people might just be like, well, why don't we just put it at the same point? <coughs> okay, let's put it at the same point. So we put P, basically P equals Q. Well, what's the issue with that, right? That's saying that, so when P is X1, Y1, then Q is also X1, Y1. And that's, that means that our slope equation is going to be y1 minus y1 over x1 minus x1. That's an issue. That doesn't really do anything. So clearly, what we're talking about here is impossible. There's no way we can do that, right? Well, not exactly. We might actually notice this, you know, you might look at that and think, well, we actually got zero over zero a lot of times when we were doing our limits. Um, so maybe we could actually squeeze something out of this. Maybe we could actually get um, a value out of here, even though it doesn't necessarily exist, right? Even, even if I can't plug in the numbers and get something exactly, I might be able to study the behavior as I approach that point, because there could be something consistent that happens every time. And the reality is, is that there's actually truth to that, okay? <laughs> and what that's going to lead us to is that's going to be able to find the slope of what's called the tangent line at that point, okay? So what do we mean when we talk about tangent line? So <laughs> let me draw a quick picture just to kind of demonstrate this. Um, as a reminder, the... So if I have this curve, right, a secant line to this curve is the one we've already seen. If I take two points, P and Q, and I just draw a line between them, right, and these are two points on the curve, then this is, <laughs> this is a secant line. It intentionally passes through two points of the curve to get the slope. What is a tangent line then? Well, a tangent line doesn't pass through this couple times. It doesn't need to. Sometimes it might coincidentally, um, but it's gonna look something like this. Right, notice that that line, and I'll kind of, let me finish the secret line real quick for us so we can kind of see, get a good comparison. Notice the tangent line really runs a, like perfectly across that parabola, only touching once in that area. And it gives us that tangent line should have the same exact slope as what kind of the slope of that curve looks like at that point. Okay, so essentially what we're seeing here, right, is that what in, in a bit more informal terms here, the limit, bring in the limit, that's why it's important, uh, as Q approaches point P, right? Because that's kind of how we draw this. We have a point P and point Q, but now we want the slope at point P. 
So we're saying the limit as Q approaches P of line PQ should be equivalent to this tangent line, which I would, so this is, this right here is a tangent line. Okay, so we're looking for a limit. We're wanting to basically establish a couple of different points and be able to take the limit as the difference between them approaches zero to get a value out of this. Okay, so to do this, <coughs> let's continue to draw some pictures because I think one of the best ways to understand this is geometrically. So, what we're going to do is so here's my graph. Let's say here's my curve. Okay, so my curve is going to look something like this. Okay, and I have my two points. So we'll say here's Q and here's P. We won't worry as much about using P and Q directly, but we're going to kind of understand what this changes, right? So as we go between Q and P, right, we're going to have a change in some values, right? So <laughs> Q, this, this initial Q point has a certain distance that it, it starts at, right? And then the distance between this point and this point, that is known as delta x, right? That is, or the change in x, right? The difference between this point and this point is how far in x I've gone. And the distance between this point, right? So where the y was here and where it is now, this is delta y, right? The change in y. So I go up this much in y over this much in x, right? This is just the equation of the slope, right? I do delta y over delta x. So I see how much I change in the y direction over how much I change in the x direction. And so this would give us a slope of a line that looks something like this, okay? As it runs through. Now, what's gonna happen, right? So <laughs> let's say that at this point, I have a value, it's x, okay? Just some random x value, right? So that means that this value at this point, right? If this distance is delta x and this is x, then I can call this point x plus delta x, right? Because if I clearly, if I move delta x over to the right, then I'm gonna get x plus delta x. Great. Now, what about delta y? Or sorry, what about these points? Well, this point, right? here, I'll just call that y, right? We're going to start from there, right? And then we move up a distance of delta y. So in order to move up a distance of delta y, I just, I just add it to y. So this is going to be the point y plus delta y. Okay, why is that significant? Well, that's, <laughs> look, if, if q, right? So if q is the point x, y, and p is the point x plus delta x, y plus delta y. Well, what happens when we put this into the slope formula? We're going to get, so our slope is going to be y2, so I'll get, which is y plus delta y, minus y1 over x2, x plus delta x, minus x1, which is y minus y, <coughs> that's zero, x minus x is zero, we get delta y over delta x. That still matches with our slope formula, right? And so that all works out good, okay? And even, even more, what do we have here, right? <laughs> what, is, what is y? Well, if this is a function, right? So if this graph is f of x, then this point simply is the point is f of x, right? y is equal to f of x. y plus delta y then is simply f of this of the second point, which is x plus delta x. Just like that. Okay. <coughs> so again, if, if all we need to do then, right, is just we need to understand, right, this applies for any function. Right? This doesn't just have to be for this strange curve I've made, but we can do this for anything, right? So now when we kind of build our slope, right? Remember that the slope is delta y over delta x. But 
we can rewrite delta y a little bit, right? <coughs> we can kind of put it in terms of this function we've made here, right? We can kind of put it in terms of f and put it in terms of whatever y is, right? Well, y is just f of x. So we're going to get from this that delta y is f of x plus delta x minus y, which y is f of x. So this is another way to write delta y. Delta y is essentially f of x plus delta x minus f of x. And so I'm going to replace that here in the slope formula to get f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. OK. And this is commonly, this quantity we just found here is commonly called the difference quotient, OK? <coughs> Which, this actually works out pretty nicely, right? Because notice, what do we have? We have y plus delta y, y2 minus y, y1 over x plus delta x, x2 minus x, which is x1. And so we're simply left with this quantity. And this allows us to write it in terms of any function possible, right? So it doesn't matter what the function is, we can plug it in and get this, okay? And so this is our delta y over delta x, right? So now what would be, right? So this, this really works for any case, right? So this, this, if I use the delta x and delta y given here the exact values and kind of put them in, then I would be able to figure out what the slope of the secant line is, right? <coughs> But now we have a function that's solely in, in terms of x and delta x of my slope, right? So the reason why I wanted to introduce the f of x here, right, is so I don't have to necessarily use y. I can just use functions of x, so I can be dealing with x. Is that I can study what happens if I let this delta x term <coughs> become as small as possible, right? Because I want the difference between P and Q, as we talked about before, to be so to be minimal, to be nothing, right? I want it to be shrunken down. Okay, so let's um, let's uh, kind of move some stuff up here. Again, reiterate. So, working through the slope, we wanted to get kind of an expression for delta y over delta x, but we wanted to put it in terms of the function so that no matter what the function is, we could always find what this is. And in this case, we found that delta y can be written as f of x plus delta x minus f of x, okay? So we're given some x value and some delta x value to put into this function. Um, let me divide this by delta. Okay, and that will be, <coughs> this gives us another expression for the slope in terms of the function. Now, the reason this is useful to us, right, is because, what do we want to think about? Right, so this is, this is a, I'm going to write over here, slope of line PQ. But now, I, what I want to happen is I want Q and P to be the same thing, right? So if Q and P are the same thing, we, write, we want Q to approach P, then that means that their, the difference in their X values is nothing, right? So what we want to happen is, is, right, so that means that we want delta X to approach zero, <coughs> correct? In order to find the tangent line of a graph, I don't want to just keep worrying about the secant line. I want to take that Q point and move it up. So I'll move it here, move it here, and move it into that P point so I can get not just the secant line between the two values, but the tangent line. Okay, so in order to do that, I need the difference, right? So this difference here, this delta X value, I want that to be zero, right? But obviously, we can't just make it zero, because if you made this zero, you get f of x minus f of x over zero, which would be zero over zero. So that always would make that zero. Okay, so what we can do 
is we'll take the limit. So <coughs> we will be taking the limit as delta x approaches zero of delta y over delta x, which is the limit as delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. Okay, and this will give us <coughs> slope of tangent line. Okay. Now that we've reached this point, this quantity actually has a name. And I'll be kind of going over both of those. So the first thing that you'll want to, so we can write this thing as dy over dx, which is the limit as delta x approaches zero of delta y over <coughs> delta x. Okay, now why, why do we substitute the triangles for these d's? Well, this d suggests kind of a super, super, super infinitely small rate uh, slope, right? Which is what we're looking for here, right? It's the slope itself isn't small, but it's found through these small pieces, okay? Because we're not interested in big changes anymore. We're interested in basically understanding what's happening as we're approaching that, which has very minimal change in each piece. So we, we write this dy over dx, okay? <clears throat> and this thing is also called f prime, okay? So I take the function, I put a little, pri a little dash on it, and I call that f prime of, and the book uses xo. So I will kind of follow suit with that. And so f prime of xo, so all these are the same thing, keep in mind. Um, so this is the limit as delta x approaches zero of f of xo plus delta x minus f of xo over delta x. So essentially, I just took that xo here and plugged it in so you can kind of see where it matches up, okay? So this is the formal definition of the derivative. It is the limit of the slope as delta x approaches zero. Okay, hopefully you all are following along still so far. Um, hopefully everything's good there. <coughs> Take a bit of a brain break there as we kind of work through this. Um, but this is the derivative. Okay, this is kind of our concept of the derivative. The second one you're going to want to be familiar with. Okay, so it is. So if it's if this limit is called the derivative. Okay, we'll kind of have give it more of a practical um, <coughs> nature as we kind of move on. But just as a quick example, maybe to help those who can't think as much with all of the symbols and stuff, let's kind of think about it like this, right? Um, Whenever you're driving a vehicle, you're not interested in your average uh, rate of your average miles per hour as you drive, right? You're not you're not concerned about, you know, oh, I drove this much here and this much here, so what's been my average miles per hour that I've driven? You don't care about that. What you care about, <laughs> I mean, sometimes you might care just to, as out of interest, but at that very moment, what do you want to know? You want to know what how fast you are driving at that very moment. You want to know how much, how fast your speed is at that very moment. And that is what the derivative tells you. It tells you kind of the exact speed at that time. Okay. Not just an average speed. It gives you the exact speed. Okay. And we don't need to know how many mod we, it can tell us that at that exact moment. And so that's what the derivative is doing. It's saying the limit is at that very point. So <coughs> as our delta X approaches zero, That'll be, that's our derivative. Okay. Now we're gonna be doing a lot of work to find these as you might imagine. Um, 
this this first lesson we're going to be doing it more of the using this definition okay this more formal way to find it although um later on we will learn more shortcuts to be able to evaluate these a lot easier because there are actually a lot of shortcuts involved with, with derivatives um, that make these things pretty simple to, to work out so the process to do that um to find the derivative is called differentiation okay so um the process, all right, here, the process to find the derivative is called differentiation. Okay, so if you run into a problem that says differentiate the function, it is the same thing as, as asking to find the derivative. Okay, that's just, it's different language to mean essentially the same thing. Um, we also say that if a function, all right, a function is differentiable, At a point, if the derivative exists, at that point, okay. So if the derivative exists at a point, then the function is differentiable at that point. Okay. So another word to kind of familiar so so derivatives derivative deri differentiation differentiable something you want to kind of just get in your head a little bit we're all talking about the derivative we're talk all talking about slopes okay cool so that basically finishes 2.3 2.4 teaches us how to find a derivative and that process to find the derivative <coughs> is called the four step process, at least for this class. Your, this class uses a special kind of four step process to be able to find derivatives. Okay. And I'm going to lay out that process step by step here. Okay. Step number one. Okay. And <laughs> replace x with x plus delta x and y plus delta y. Oh, I'm sorry. And y with y plus delta y into <coughs> the statement. y equals f of x. Okay, so that turns into, right, this step would insinuate that this is going to turn into y equals y plus delta y, right? Because <laughs> we replace y with y plus delta y, and we replace x with x plus delta x. Just like that. Okay, so that is the very first step. So let's see this more on a practical level, right? So let's say that we have, um, um, for this step, let's suppose that we have, so I'll go ahead with like a first example here. We'll use y is x squared plus three. I want to find the derivative of this thing, okay? The first step says that I need to take y, so we're going to use step one here. I'm going to take y and replace it with y plus delta y. And I'm going to take x and replace it with x plus delta x. 
So I'm going to get x plus delta x squared plus 3. Okay, keep in mind, <coughs> do not just put delta x on the end, right? Whenever, just like here, I put x plus delta x inside of that. So x needs to be replaced with x plus delta x. I do not just replace x with x and then leave the delta x on the side, okay? I put the entirety of x plus delta x in place of x. Okay. Awesome. So let's go ahead. I might actually write this <coughs> over. So I'm going to get y plus delta y equals x plus delta x squared plus three. Okay. Now let's erase that. <coughs> Step two. in our four-step process. Subtract y equals f of x from both sides of the new equation. Okay, so that means that I'm going to take that y, <coughs> y plus delta y equals f of x plus delta x. And I'm going to subtract y equals f of x from both sides. So essentially, this left side, I'm subtracting y. But on this right side, I want the f's to match up. So in this side, I'm going to be subtracting f of x, right? which that's a true statement, right? Y is equal to f of x, so we're still subtracting the same thing from both sides. So when I subtract y from this side, that just cancels out the y. But when I subtract f of x here, I get delta y equals f of x plus delta x minus <laughs> So how does that apply here? Well, again, I subtract y from both sides and subtract f of x, which f of x in this case, so remember this x squared plus three is my f of x. I'm gonna subtract x squared plus three from both sides, okay? So that leaves me with delta y, so remember this is the step two now we're on, delta y equals x plus delta x squared plus three minus x squared plus three. <coughs> okay, awesome. So that is where we're at on step two. So delta y is x plus delta x squared plus three minus x squared plus three. Okay. Now, as you might see, we probably could work on simplifying a little bit, a little bit of this, can't we? But before we do that, let's, um, <coughs> before we try to simplify anything, let's kind of work on doing the next step. Okay, so step number three here. Step three. Divide both sides of the expression. <coughs> by delta x. Okay, so I'll actually rewrite that by delta x. Okay, so, right, we had delta y equals f of x plus delta x minus f of x. So this is saying to divide delta x from both sides. So I divide delta x from both sides and that leaves me with this. <coughs> Pretty simple, right? I just take both sides and I divide by delta x. Okay, and I'm going to take that same exact concept again, do step three down here, right? So this was, so we did step one, this was step two. Now we're doing step three, where I take delta x and divide it from both sides. Okay. And so that's going to leave us with delta y over delta x 
equals <coughs> x plus delta x squared plus three minus x squared plus three over delta x. Or to fit more what's up here, delta y over delta x equals f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. Okay, still not too bad at all. Okay, finally, for step four, <coughs> we're gonna obtain f prime of x by evaluating <coughs> the limit as delta x approaches zero of delta y over delta x, okay? which is the limit as delta x approaches zero of the expression we just found, right? Which in general is f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x, okay? <coughs> and so this is where the meat of the work happens here is finding this limit, okay? So hopefully you have steps one, two, and three written down here for this example. I'm gonna pull it up and we're gonna work on this limit. So we're going to be finding the limit as delta x approaches zero of delta y over delta x, which is the same thing as the limit as delta x approaches zero of, what did we find? We said x plus delta x squared plus three minus x squared plus three all over delta x. Okay, so there's a lot that could be simplified up here. So let's work on simplifying that, okay? First, x plus delta x squared, okay? <laughs> so, um, right, what we can do, right, of course, is anytime I have something plus something and then square it, right, I, I can kind of treat it as a binomial. So I can write that as x plus delta x times x plus delta x, okay? which that's gonna leave me with x times x, x squared, x times delta x, plus another x times delta x, plus delta x squared. Okay, um, but something I want to introduce for us, um, <laughs> so that's absolutely correct. Something I wanna introduce for us that'll help you to do this work a little easier is by knowing something called um, Pascal's triangle, okay? So you may have seen this before. One, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one, one, four, six, four, one, ten, five, ten, ten, one. <coughs> so you can always multiply out the normal way. Um, that you've learned before. Um, but this might actually be a nice shortcut way in order to multiply out quantities like this, okay? So to explain what's going on here, this top guy here represents zero. This row here represents one, two, three, four, five, etc. <coughs> and how this works is that if I have, so let me take an example, right? So let's say I'm taking A plus B, and I want to take it to the fourth power, okay? What I'm going to do is I look at the fourth row, and I see I have one, four, six, four, one. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to take <laughs> that first term, and I'm going to raise it to the fourth power, okay? And then I'm going to take that number one, and I'm going to put it on the front. So one, eight to the fourth, or you could just write eight to the fourth. Next, I'm going to take one of those A's off, but I still need to have four terms. And so I put a B on. So I'm going to have plus A cubed times B, okay? <coughs> so it's a different term. I can't necessarily add those together, right? Um, but now we have A cubed B here, right? And now we go to the next number, which would be the number four, okay? 
Next, I go to, <coughs> I take off another A, I add another B, and so I get A squared, B squared. And what's the coefficient on the front of that? It's gonna be the number six. Okay. Next, I take off another B, and so I got another A, add on another B, so I get A, B cubed, and I get four on that one to match this coefficient. And finally, I get one times B to the fourth power. <coughs> okay, now notice every term is covered here. Um, I always have four of something, right? I have four A's, four B's, three A's and one B, one A and three B's, and then two A's and two B's, right? That's all the possible matchups, and I just work from left to right to get those. And so these are going to be the numbers that go in front, okay? In this case, you would have seen just by multiplying that it <coughs> works out. So again, if, if your preference is just to multiply things out naturally, right? So again, let me kind of reiterate here. Um, if I wanted to multiply out x plus delta x times x plus delta x naturally, or even if it was cubed, so I wanted to multiply another one, that's completely fine. You just make sure to FOIL one at a time. But if you want to save yourself a bit of time, then just kind of think back to this and say, OK, I'm going to take the first term, 1 times x squared plus 2 times 1x times 1 delta x. Right, so I take off an x, add on a delta x, and then plus one times the last term squared. And so I get that. But of course, you can always just multiply it and get it again. Okay, as I did at first, so don't be afraid to do that. Just something that might help if it, if, if it comes to me. Okay, so if you uh, want more clarification on that or want to learn that a bit more, just let me know, and I would be happy to help you out. Okay. So anyway, coming back to our problem, right? Our limit we're evaluating. <clears throat> I'm gonna take the limit as delta x approaches zero again, right? But now when I square this, I'm gonna get x squared plus two x delta x plus delta x squared plus three minus, now that negative is gonna to distribute to each term. So I get minus x squared and minus three. So I get minus x squared minus three. And that's going to all be over delta x. Okay. Now, what's going to happen here, right? x squared and x squared, they're going to cancel out. 3 and 3 are also going to cancel out. Okay. Now, what do you notice about all the terms on the top? They only have a delta x left over, don't they? So, delta x, delta x, I'm just going to take that. and factor it out, but factor one of them out, right? Because they both have a delta x in common, right? So if they have something in common, I can pull it to the outside. So I'm gonna have the limit as delta x approaches zero of delta x times two x plus delta x all over delta x. Okay, now what do you notice? Delta x over delta x, those are gonna cancel. So we're gonna be left with the limit as delta x approaches zero of 2x plus delta x. I'm not getting zero over zero anymore, right? I just get 2x plus delta x. And I can put zero into that for delta x, right? That's just going to be 2x plus zero, which is simply 2x. So in the end, we see that f prime of x is equal to 2x. Right? And that was when f of x was x squared plus three. Or we can write that the derivative, so dy over dx is 2x in this case. It's, just, it's the same thing as saying f prime of x. Okay? But 2x is our answer there. All right, so in that process, we found the derivative. Great. Okay, let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. <clears throat> awesome. Okay. So let's now, okay, so now we have this. <coughs> Let me take that quick example, right? And we'll, we'll go through and, and uh, practice a bit more here. Um, but let's take our, the example that we worked out here. Okay, so four-step process, always do the same thing. 
and we'll be running through it again, right, as we do with the next few problems. So, but now that we have f prime of x, now we have f prime of x. What do we do? What do we do with it? Well, here's a here's an example of what we could do with that. Okay, because a lot of our work is just going to be finding those because we want to make sure that you know how to find them to be able to use them. But how can I apply this? Well, let's let's think about the situation. So, um, suppose I want the slope. I want the tangent line, sorry, to the graph f of x is equal to x squared plus 3 at the point 1, 4. Okay, so that's a point on this graph, and I want to get the tangent line at that point. Okay, well, if we want the slope of the tangent, so, so we want a line, we want the tangent line, right? And whenever we want the tangent line, we need two things, right? What two things do we need? We need slope, slope of i, and we need a point. Well, it's pretty easy, we already got a point, so that's pretty nice, but we need to get the slope now, right? But that's exactly what f prime tells us, right? So we see that for f of x, that f prime of x is 2x. So how do I find the slope of the point x equals 1, y equals 4? Well, x equals 1, right? So I'm going to plug in 1 into f prime, and I'm going to get 2 times 1, which is 2. So that's the slope at that point, right? So now we can use point slope form and get that. So that point slope form, if you remember, is we take y minus y naught, <coughs> which is the point, which is the y value of our point, right, that we're given, equals the slope m, which in this case is f prime of 1 times x minus x naught, which is the x value we're getting, right? So this graph is going to give us y minus 4 equals 2 times x minus 1, which is, which is the same thing as y minus 4 equals 2x minus 2. If I add 4 to both sides, that gives me that y equals 2x minus 2 plus 4 plus 2. And so that would be the tangent line to the graph at that point, okay? So this is one use um, of the tangent line that kind of allows us to um, see this. So just, just as a picture, okay? So let's see um, on the side here, here's x squared plus 3. Oops. Okay. So the line we just found... Looks something like that, right? So this line hits the graph at this at this one point, which is one four. One four here's one, and it has a slope of two. Running right along it. Okay. So here's an example problem to keep you might keep your eyes on. Um, I think I did provide a couple of examples like this um, at some point, but that is how you can kind of find the tangent line. You need the point and the slope, but they shouldn't be too hard to find. Okay.
<coughs> We're talking about the four step process. So let's do more examples of the four step process, shall we? Okay. We're going to take, so find the derivative. I was taking the book here. Uh, y equals 2x cubed minus x. Okay, so step one, I'm going to replace y with y plus delta y, and I'm going to replace x with x plus delta x. <coughs> right, so again, I plug x plus delta x in for x. I don't just throw delta x on the side. It goes with x wherever x was. Okay. Number two, I subtract y equals f of x from both sides. So that leaves me with delta y equals 2 times x plus delta x cubed minus x plus delta x minus y equals f of x equals 2x cubed minus x. <coughs> and I get that. Step three, I divide delta x from both sides. So I get delta y over delta x equals 2 times x plus delta x cubed minus x plus delta x minus 2x cubed minus x all over delta x. Okay. And then finally, we take <coughs> the limit of that thing. So we're going to take the limit as delta x approaches 0 of delta y over delta x. Okay. Which Let's go ahead and try to simplify some of the top, right? So to spare some of the time, I'm going to multiply out this, which will give me 2x cubed plus 6x squared delta x plus 6x delta x squared plus 2 delta x cubed minus so we distribute that minus sign to both pieces. So I get minus x minus delta x and then minus 2x cubed plus x. And that's all over delta x. Okay. So I subtracted, distributed a minus sign to the things I needed. <coughs> and so we're left with this, right? So now what's going to be kind of taken off? What's going to be taken away when I do this? Well, we have a positive 2x cubed and a negative 2x cubed. We have a minus x and a plus x. And that looks like maybe everything that we can combine together, at least for now, which is OK. Um, but notice that everything left over has a delta x in it. So we get delta x times 6x squared plus 6x plus 2, or sorry, plus 6x delta x plus 2 delta x squared, right? Because there's two delta x's here, so one gets taken away. Three delta x's here, so two, one got taken away, so we get delta x squared still. Um, and then minus 1, because there's a <coughs> minus delta x here. And that's all over delta x. Okay. Notice that the delta x is divide. And so now we're just left with the limit as x approaches, as delta x approaches zero of 6x squared plus 6x delta x plus 2 delta x squared minus 1. But as delta x approaches zero, these both become zero. And so that leaves me with the expression 6x squared minus 1. Okay. And so this is f prime of x. And then if it were to ask you to find the slope at a particular point um, or a particular points, then once you had this expression using the four step process, then you can just plug in, right? So if I wanted F prime of zero, I would just put zero in for X and I get six times zero squared minus one, which would be minus one. If I want F prime of one, I get six times one squared minus one, which would be five, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, a couple more examples. <laughs> We're going to find the derivative of y equals 1 over um, x plus 2. Okay. 
And then we're going to say at x equals um, <coughs> negative one and x equals one. Let's see. Okay, cool. So now, so don't plug in yet, okay? Wait to plug in until the very, very end of the problem, okay? So number three, I think this is for us. Uh, well, actually, I'll just, we want to use the numbers right for the steps. So you can find the derivative of this function. So number one, replace y with delta y plus delta y, and replace x with x plus delta x, okay? Two, um, subtract f of x from y equals f of x from both sides. So that gives us delta y equals one over x plus delta x plus two minus one over x plus two. <coughs> Three, divide delta x from both sides. Okay, remember, we want to leave all of that x plus delta x plus two minus one over x plus two all on the bottom. We want to leave that delta x on the bottom of all of that. Okay, four, find the limit. So we're going to take the limit as delta x approaches zero of delta y over delta x. And so to solve this one, right, first, I want to be able to combine these two fractions together. And so that's going to require us to get a common denominator. Okay, common denominator, you know, we can't really get a necessarily nice one. So to make this work, right, if I want to, since this guy is missing an x plus two term, I'm going to multiply the top and bottom of it by x plus two. And since this one's missing that x plus delta x plus two term, I'm going to multiply the top and bottom of that by x plus delta x plus two. So minus x plus delta x plus two. And because I multiplied x plus two here and multiplied x plus delta x plus two here, the common denominator in that case becomes x plus two times x plus delta x plus two in that case, okay? And of course we're still, so we're taking the limit as delta x approaches zero, and then this is all over delta x, okay. So this is gonna simplify into the limit as delta x approaches zero of <coughs> x plus two minus x minus delta x minus two all over um, x plus two times x plus delta x plus two. Now, something that might help us out as we're working on this, can you see that? It's a little hard, I'm not sure why. It's so kind of foggy there um, on the board. Um, okay, no, you can kind of see it now, okay. So we have x plus two minus x minus delta x minus two over x plus two times x plus delta x plus two. And these two things are multiplying. Now, what I want to keep in mind here, right, is if I have a, so let's consider this thing on the bottom as delta x over one, right? So I'm dividing one fraction by another one. And whenever I'm dividing two fractions, right? So if I was doing one half divided by three quarters, Reminder that I can rewrite this as one half, one over two, change the sign in the middle, and then multiply by the reciprocal of the bottom. So that would become four over three. And so that would end up being four over two, which is two, so two thirds, okay? <coughs> so what I can do is, is instead of dividing by delta x over one, I can multiply this whole expression by one over delta x, okay? Which, so x and x cancel each other out. Two and two cancel each other out. And then we have minus delta x over delta x. Well, those delta x's are gonna cancel out, aren't they? So we're gonna be left with the limit as delta x approaches zero of negative one over x plus two times x plus delta x plus two. Well, in this case, we just have to plug in delta x is zero, right? Because it doesn't, it works now. And we get negative one over x plus two times x plus two, which would end up being negative one over x plus two. Okay, 
And so F prime of X in this case is negative one over X plus two squared as our final answer. Okay, so now what if I wanted it at X is negative one? Well, I'm gonna put negative one in down here. And so I get negative one over negative one plus two squared. Negative one plus two is one, one squared is one. So we get negative one over one. So which is one. So we get F prime of negative one is one. And then F prime of one, if I put one in there, I get one plus two, which is three. Three squared is nine. And negative one, <coughs> sorry, negative one over nine. I mean, that's just negative one over nine. So that's gonna be minus one. Okay. And so this would be your final answer down here with plugging in the values, of course, and everything that we got. All right. Let's see. I think I just have um, one more example. And then I'll talk real quick about the derivative as a sort of rate of change. Um, <coughs> so we're going to find the derivative of. Um, also, if, if you don't um, really have a grasp quite yet on finding the derivative of some of these things, um, or like want more examples of the rational functions and the sort, then I would encourage you to read into the book. Um, I just don't want to go over my time with this. So, um, <coughs> okay, find the derivative of, um, we're going to do f of x equals the square root of um, x minus three. Why not? Okay. Okay, so again, always follow the four-step process, which we, so we're gonna get, so right, remember f of x is the same thing as saying y. So I'm gonna get y plus delta y equals the square root. Remember, we replace x with x plus delta x. So we get this. Step two, <coughs> um, I'm gonna get y, I'm gonna subtract y equals f of x from both sides. And so I get delta y equals the square root of x plus delta x minus three minus f of x, which is the square root of x minus three. Okay, number three, <coughs> I divide delta x from both sides. So I get delta y over delta x equals the square root of x plus delta x minus three minus the square root of x minus three all over delta x. Awesome. Okay. And then we take the limit. Okay, now we run into an interesting situation, haven't we? Okay. So I'll go ahead and skip. We, we of course, want to we're finding the limit of delta y over delta x, but that's the same thing as finding the limit of the piece on the right, which is x plus delta x minus 3 minus the square root of x minus 3 all over delta x. OK. So we've run into a similar predicament um, that we have had before. Where we ran into, we have these pesky square roots. Okay, do we remember what happened last time we had these square roots? Well, we had an infinite a limit that went towards infinity, right? We had the square root of x squared plus eight minus x. Let's see, if I want to be able to kind of get rid of those square roots without getting a weird middle term, let's, we could try to do the same thing, right? Maybe that'll work, right? Let, let's, let's try it out. It might be something good to try, okay? And we're going to find that that's actually the right thing to do. Because <coughs> I'm, so what I'm saying is I'm going to multiply this top part by x plus delta x minus three plus the square root of x minus three, and that's going to be all over delta x. Or sorry, uh, we need to multiply that by this or divide by the same thing, right? If I multiply by something, I have to divide by the same thing because otherwise it's not the same expression, right? So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate. Okay. So once I do that, that's going to leave me with the limit 
as delta x approaches zero of, so we take first times the first, so that's gonna be x plus delta x minus three. Now, since these are conjugates, remember, once I multiply this and this and add it to this times this, they cancel each other out. So that simply leaves me with minus square root of x minus three times the square root of x minus three is x minus three. And that's all over delta x times the square root of x plus delta x minus three plus the square root of x minus three. Okay. <coughs> so what do we do from here? Well, notice, so we're gonna distribute these minus signs and get minus x plus three. Well, that's just gonna cancel out all of the stuff that's on the top already and just leaves us with delta x. So we have delta x divided by delta x times the square root of x plus delta x minus three plus the square root of x minus three. Well, these delta x's must cancel out then. And so that's gonna leave us with the limit as delta x approaches zero of one over the square root of x plus delta x plus minus three plus the square root of x minus three. Well, now we can easily plug in delta x is zero, right? And so that's gonna leave us with one over the square root of x minus three plus the square root of x minus three, which is simply one over, ah, one over two times the square root. Just like that. All right, awesome. And so that will be our f prime of x and that'll be the final answer. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, please reach out to me. Um, I hope to be able to start those Friday sessions as soon as possible so that we can explore more examples like this um, and just be able to help, help you guys out. Um, but in the meantime, please feel free to read the book. Um, and it'll kind of help to make more sense as, as you kind of work through. Okay. So that's the basic gist of what I have for today. Um, <laughs> please use the four step process every time for now, um, at least until we get into the shortcut section. If I want you to use it again after that point, I will tell you um, to use it. But yeah, uh, just some, so if I want you to find the derivative, you know, feel free. So it's the same thing as doing this. Um, the book kind of lists a few different notations. So it has dy over dx, df of x over dx, which comes from saying that y is the same thing as f of x. You could also write d over dx that's sort of own operation, right? So for example, if I was one to find, you know, d over, if I said, what's well, d over dx of x squared plus three? Well, we did the work earlier and we would see that that would be 2x. So, <laughs> and then finally, you could also, you might also see the derivative written like the same way. So we have dx. So just a little x below kind of a bigger name. Okay. So there's some different notations of the derivative. Um, and as I kind of already got it a little bit, um, when we talk about slope, um, <laughs> we want to understand the practical. And I'm going to get into a lot more of this uh, during 2.6, but I just want to mention, like, you want to think of a derivative as, as sort of as a rate, right? So we've, you've seen rates before and things. It's, it's saying this, you have, uh, you know, your gas is filling up at this much per minute, or uh, you can let out this much water per minute sort of thing. And that's, that's what the derivative is. The derivative is kind of an exact, at that moment, uh, what we call an instantaneous rate of change. Um, and so we're gonna be able to see more of the practical use of that um, on Wednesday, the whatever day next Wednesday is, we'll kind of get to some of that. Um, for now, just recognize that uh, it's a rate, and so it's going to have some uses in that regard um, to be able to tell us how much something's changing, um, how
how fast something's changing. So that's why a lot of this is useful. Um, I would encourage you again to kind of read to the book. Um, I'm going to save some of that for next Wednesday. Um, but yeah, with all that being said, I think that's all I have. So thank you for watching again. Um, hope this is helpful. Um, hope these lectures will be helpful. Um, please, um, you know, if you have any other questions or comments or concerns, I want you to just reach out and I would be happy to um, give assistance. Thank you for watching. Hope you guys have a wonderful day.